director's report. So, Monica, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm, we're always um, appreciative of your time. You have the agenda before you. The committee does not have any recommendations to make, but it, it will receive some important updates from our facility managers. I don't have a traditional report for you this morning, but I just briefly want to address the committee's meeting schedule. Now, historically, the committee will meet for maybe five times a year. Um, obviously, that has not been the case this year. And, and I think the reality is that we've just entered into a, a new season in the life of the sports authority. And so it's gonna require us to meet more often than not. Um, and I think it's important to say that, but we do value your time. We're gonna be diligent and, and take care of business and be as efficient as we can be. And, um, and of course, I welcome your questions and comments along the way. Do you have any questions? We have four members, right, of our committee. Is that right? That's correct. I'm just wondering if, if uh, I can see Kim. Oh, I do. Kim San. Uh, should we consider, given the amount of time we meet, in increasing the number of board members of the committee? I don't know if, if Kim wants to speak to that. I mean, I think that's something that we can definitely look at. We have had for the last several years, we've been a three person committee. And so we did add a four, which we thought would be helpful. But I think we could look at, um, you know, at increasing the number if that's the will of the committee. Well, I would be interested in what you and Kim might think, and I, I don't think we need to take it up right now, but maybe just if y'all offline could talk about it. And if you say it for, that's okay. But we do have a large board, and it seems like this is where so much of the information comes through. It might be good to have another member or two on the board, on the finance committee, but just, just a thought. That's all I have for you, Chair. All right, thank you, Monica. All right, next up, we've got the Bridgestone Area Capital Assessment Management Plan, or CAMP. We've got uh, Kyle from the Predator, Kyle Clayton from the Predators, and he's got a presentation for us. Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good morning, and thank you, John. Yes, this is Kyle Clayton, the Vice President of Operations with the National Predators and Bridgestone Arena. Um, happy to be before you guys today and talk through this capital asset management plan. So if we go back last summer, we, uh, we entered into a new lease with Metro and there were several new components within that lease. Um, one of which is no public tax dollars uh, funding coming to the building anymore. So nothing from the general fund or anything like that. It's now a completely user uh, generated a funded building, which is fantastic. So that's funded through sales tax and our ticket taxes. So that was one new component of the lease. Another is the uh, the capital burden that is shifted from Metro to uh, us as the manager now, which is another great uh, factor within the lease. And then another one is the, um, the capital asset management plan. So the thought with this plan is, you know, how are we maintaining your assets? So within the lease, there are two or three different things that, uh, had to find this plan. One is a preventative maintenance program. Um, you have to stop right there, that's perfect. Uh, planning and uh, routine and preventative maintenance requirements within the building itself. Uh, then we would talk about capital expense requirements. And then the third thing is uh, every fourth year, Metro is uh, able to request a third party to come in and, and do a much more deeper dive into uh, the building and everything of that nature. And that, that stems from the 2017 facility condition assessment. And that was prepared by Venue Solutions Group. So again, that was a very extensive report done by them. And uh, back in 2017, and again, every four years, uh, Metro has the ability to go back and request that report again. So what we tried to do with this report, since it's the first time we've done this, um, we try to take the framework of the facility condition report that was prepared by facility or the new solutions group, sorry, and use that framework to create this report. So you know, we're not trying to recreate the wheel. Everyone is uh, familiar with that framework. And so really we just wanna provide updates uh, within those categories for things that have done since the report was made. And then also layer in our preventative maintenance programs as well. So uh, at least you can go down one more page. 
So as we started uh, preparing, preparing this report, you know, that was important to highlight our staff because that truly is the backbone of our organization. They take so much pride in this building. And so we try to highlight a few of our key uh, leaders in this area. And we like to show that, you know, we've got 145 years of industry experience, ex experience and 48 of those years are with the Preds organization, which is fantastic. Um, today on the call, I also have with me uh, Tim Friedenberger. He's our Vice President of Facility Operations and Matt Schick, who is our Senior Director of Operations. Uh, both of these guys are very instrumental in putting this uh, report together and they pretty much oversee just about every operation and piece of equipment listed uh, within this report, not only at the arena, but also at Fort Ice Antioch and Fort Ice Bellevue. So as we go through this, uh, this presentation, if you guys have any questions for me, um, and I, if I can't answer, then Matt and Tim are definitely here and they can uh, help out as well. But again, I want to make sure to highlight those guys and really take a minute to say thank you for all that they do to uh, keep Bridgestone Arena in top condition. So as we get into the report, um, what you'll see is we start off with some background information in each key area. And that background inf information is taken directly from the original facility condition report. And so we, we wanna make sure we reference back to the report because again, everyone's familiar with it. That's kind of the, it's a, labeled as the initial camp within the lease agreement. So again, it's got a lot of information. So we'll keep referring back to it, let it provide the background. And then we go into recent updates. So things that we've done since 2017, uh, within those key areas. Then we follow that up with a preventive, preventative maintenance program within each area as well to see if we can show um, how we're caring for the building. So again, stop me as we go here. I think we have about seven or eight categories that we'll run through. I'll try to be somewhat brief uh, in each one. I'll highlight a few different areas, um, but again, feel free to stop me and have, you know, slow me down, ask questions and anything like that. So we'll start off in architecture and interiors. So the background information here is really just very general and generic, you know, talking about the building was open in 96, capacity of the building, you know, different areas of the building, things like that. Um, so in the upgrade or update section of this, we'll really just talk through a couple of things that we've done, you know, just kind of to the overall architecture of the building, which isn't a lot, but it's just areas that we've added. So like we've added a mother's room, but we've redone the uh, home hockey locker room. We've replaced the dashboard system, things like that. And each one of those things have their own little, a preventative maintenance program, but we didn't highlight each one of those in this report because most of those things are done internally by our internal staff that we just spoke of. So um, there's not a lot of information on that because again, we haven't changed the overall architecture of the building itself. This one is just kind of a, a general update. So at least if you go down to the next one, please. The next one, so we'll get into uh, the MEP, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection. So in this one, the background information is uh, Pretty much positive all throughout and it mentions you know maintaining the building well and but a lot of equipment is reaching towards the end of life and that's that's really the reason why the uh, venue solutions group put together this report and you know, we start uh tackling those issues so when we get into the recent updates you know we've replaced a, a sprinkler system we replaced our sports lighting system we've updated restrooms and things like that um at least if you go down to the next page we'll get into our preventative maintenance program so here's an example of how we kind of laid this out. You know, we take these different disciplines within this uh, MEP section and we break it out based on vendor, um, the areas that they're responsible for, and then how often uh, they complete these tasks. So for example, of course in fire and safety, there are a fire protection provider, and therefore they're going through and doing their annual inspections. Some things are semi-annual and different alarms and things like that. Uh, then we get into WMI, uh, they're in charge of our ice plant maintenance. So they come out and do their uh, their reviews annually as well. And in each one of these, uh, our staff that we listed previously, whether it's our plumbers, our electricians, our directors, they're always on uh, on these walks and going through these inspections as well. At least you'll keep going down, please. Then we get into our HVAC uh, and controls, and as well as our emergency generators. Keep going, please. And then lastly in this section is our water treatment. So again, when we go through our uh, MEPs and fire protection, you know, this is a good example of showing you our preventative maintenance program along with our updates. I believe next is structure. So again, here we've really listed out the background information from the, I'm sorry, was there a question? Yes. Yes. So um, just remind 
find me. I, I remember upgrade in the HVAC system at some point in the past few years. So, and that was to save an electrical costs. It, it, well, it had a lot of reasons. Did that happen? I was looking at this HVAC and I was in the maintenance, prevented maintenance. And I, I just don't remember if that was something that was, you know, was perspective or that's something that was done. And now we are doing preventive maintenance on a revamp of the HVAC system in the arena. I can't even sure what what that was. I just um, just don't remember any of it except that. <laughs> So, so you, you cut out at the very beginning, but I think what uh, the key point of that is, so back in, I believe it was, uh, it was when Tim first arrived, I think it was in 13 or 14, uh, we received a federal grant to uh, upgrade our HVA system and, and a lot of other systems. And as part of that grant, we were able to, you know, upgrade those. And yes, now we have preventative maintenance programs on those. Um, the items that are in the capital projects summary that were approved for future projects, a lot of those came directly from the uh, Venue Solutions Group report because they, they did a capital matrix, which was great, and they kind of timed everything out. So we use that as a guide, and we have those projects on the report as approved. But obviously, we're not going to do a capital project related to those unless it's you know completely necessary. So we're going to continue servicing that equipment and repairing it as we go, um, but not necessarily go through with a overhaul of that system until it's completely necessary. Does that answer your question? Yes. I, I, what I was trying to get at is, did we overhaul the, old, the whole HVA system in the arena at that time or just some selective places? Yeah. Kyle, if I may, this is Sean Margaret. Thanks for the questions. About six years ago, we started a three-year complete overhaul of the HVAC systems, the lighting system, the plumbing systems, um, replaced or recommissioned, you know, basically replaced or renovated um, all the cooler cooling towers, all the units, all the air handler units, upgraded them, made them more energy efficient, uh, but also made them more hockey compliant to make sure we could make ice ideally into June or I guess now July or August at times. Um, and then this report as Kyle said, responds more to what we all hired that company to do, to look at the building over the next, I think it was 20 years, uh, what uh, PMs needed to be done. And then from a staging and future standpoint, when did they need to be replaced again? So if you want, we can send out a complete breakdown of what was completely replaced and what was recommissioned. Uh, no, starting, I think six years no, ago, six, that three is, years. I appreciate that. that. I was just trying to get when the when all of that was done versus the 2017 report versus where we are and i think that gives me all the context i need so thank you both oh, great. That answers my question thank you all right so we'll uh, we'll move on to the structure of the building so again the background information is overall positive um as we got into recent updates uh the, the real update here which was fantastic in 2019 um, we reinforce our steel structure within the bowl itself. And really what that does is allows us to have bigger and badder shows essentially. So we went from a 120,000 pound capacity to a 200,000 pound uh, rigging capacity for a normal in-stage concert setup. And also at our center stage, we went from 120 or sorry, from 80,000 pounds to 200,000 pounds. That really allowed for the new Fang Vision, our new um, uh, center home scoreboard, as well as rigging shows around that as well. So again, you know, shows are getting bigger and bigger every single year. Every time a new tour comes through, you know, they, they're seeing how many lights and uh, speakers they can hang from the ceiling, which is fantastic. And it really adds a dynamic uh, element to our concert series, which is fantastic. And this really allows us to do much, much more and compete with all other buildings. And again, our goal is to be the number one sports and entertainment venue in North America. And this really helps us get there. So as we uh, took that increase and, and, Reinforce that steel. Obviously, we also have a preventive maintenance program um, with that uh, steel provider, and they come out and check all the uh, inspections and the engineers and everything like that. Um, they're constantly out there uh, before each show just to make sure that we're our diagrams and our calculations, everything matches with what the show uh, specifically needs. Um, all right, at least if you go to the next one, I believe it's yeah, AV and IT. So in this one. Again, the background information, it's, it's positive, but at the time, a lot of our um, AV uh, equipment was getting towards end of life, such as our scoreboards and things like that. So as I think we're all aware, 
I think it was 18, 18, we replaced our control room, our ribbon boards, our audio system, all those things that were getting to the end of their life. And then last summer, we completed our new center hung scoreboard replacement um, as well. Also within this area, there's a lot of things that I cannot speak to, but servers, switches, firewalls, basically faster internet for everybody in the building and things like that. Um, there, each individual item, we didn't list out the preventative maintenance program going on with each one. A lot of these items, they're so new, they're still under warranty. Um, there's certain things that have to be done to check each year. And we also have an in-house staff that, uh, that manages all this inventory as well. So um, that's a big upgrade that was very visual for all of our fans and everybody at Smash. I think we all remember those conversations for the past couple summers. Uh, all right, at least if you keep going down, we'll get to the roofs, I believe. So in this background information, this is this is probably the main one that was not an overall positive comment, and this is something that we took uh, you know to heart very very deeply. And within this one, you know, they talked about um, it's a twenty year old roof and a roof of this size and this type of material. It's experiencing you know a lot of deterioration, a lot of deficiencies, and things like that. So in two thousand eighteen, uh, we went out and put out an RFP for roofing contractors to come out and basically do another assessment on that roof itself with their expertise. And we ended up going with Maxwell Roofing and they came out and graded each of the areas and we addressed every single one of those. And not only did we correct the, the issues and deficiencies, but we also extended the life of that roof. So the Venue Solutions Board, you know, puts out the roof needs replaced in X year, but we have now extended past that uh, based on the uh, repair and maintenance that we've done on it in the year of 2018. So now going forward, I think if you scroll down, there is a preventative maintenance program where essentially Maxwell comes back out and they do that same assessment every year, provide a report, and then we go tackle those repairs as needed. Uh, but we have further extended the life of that route uh, with this program in place. All right, at least if you go to the next one, we've got vertical transportation, which is a fancy word for elevators and escalators. Um, again, overall positive comments, but there's a couple of recommendations, especially related to our Freight elevators, things like that. Some of the updates that we've done recently really uh, are towards safety of the uh, the passengers in those elevators and the folks that are moving the equipment. Because a lot of people use those that are, are familiar with our building, such as you know shows and folks like that that come in and use those freight elevators. So want to make sure we uh, tackle the safety issues there. Um, but we have uh, Cone in as our service provider on that. We work with them on the recommendations from this report and continue to tackle those each and every year. So. A uh, good program there in place with Cone to uh, tackle those recommendations. Uh, all right, at least you go to the next one, please. It's uh, FF&E, Furniture, Fixtures, and Equipment. So here, you know, this, this is one where we love to highlight some things that we've done over the past couple of years, different pieces of equipment that we've purchased that really, you know, it provides a better experience not only for the fans that come into the building, but also our staff and obviously the performers that are coming in our store. So. A couple of things we've done here is new concert seating on the floor, um, safety measures for our guests coming in the building with new x-ray machines at the entrances. Uh, for the shows themselves, we uh, upgraded our spotlights uh, for those events, and then a new concert stage as well. But again, there's, there's a lot of things listed there. Um, a lot of these have different preventive maintenance programs. You know, to highlight a couple, uh, Hussey seating, we have the retractable seating all the way around the arena for the first, uh, I think it's 13, 14 rows. And so those are under preventive maintenance program, as well as our spotlights and our stage equipment and things like that. So they all have their own individual programs. All right, uh, Alicia, if you will go down a few more. So then we get into others. So th this is one of just information that we thought would be uh, appropriate to share at this time. So we go through and we talk about our kind of pest control um, systems or our, our agreements there. And then really we get into housekeeping. You know, we really want to take a minute to brag on Janet King there. They've come to the building a couple of years ago and they've, they've just been a fantastic partner and the work that they've done to keep that building um, so clean and so safe. And, and they've just done a wonderful job and their staff's great. They're, they're great partners in this. And especially now as we get into, you know, COVID-19 and different cleaning protocols and, you know, trying to prepare to come out of this and host events again, uh, they've been a great partner just working with us and building um, different programs and different uh, measure, putting the different measures in place, especially when we got to host training camp within the Bridgestone Arena for uh, our return to play program. Again, they were just great partners within that. So we highlighted a few things that 
they've done, uh, we put into place during return to play, but then also as we're, we're preparing to come out of this. So I yeah, just wanted to highlight them for a second for the great job they've done. Uh, okay, if you will keep going down, please. That's more, Jana King, that's fine. Keep going. Again, more things coming out of COVID. Okay, so now kind of section two, I'd call it, of the, the camp. Uh, we talk about capital expense requirements. So I think we all remember in previous years, we, we'd go through and we submit projects and then we'd have questions about how we're going to fund it. And it was just really honestly just uncomfortable situations. But now with this new lease in place, you know, it really provides a long-term funding source for our capital projects. And again, it's all user-generated funds. So that's sales tax and our two ticket taxes. So as more people are coming to the building, it's going to allow us to have uh, more capital funding to do these projects. And again, that burden is taken away from Metro. There's no Metro tax dollars coming into this building anymore, which is fantastic. So in years past, you know, we, we'd submit a couple of new projects, you know, we discuss them and have a great conversation there. This year, obviously with um, the abnormal times that we're under with COVID, really we're taking this opportunity to kind of examine and explore different opportunities and to see how this pandemic is gonna change you know, how the world interacts, because especially in large gatherings. So with that said, we're not submitting for approval anything new this year, no new projects. Uh, we'll, we'll focus on the project list that's already been submitted and approved in previous years, including last year with, with the new lease. Um, so with that said, um, the, the project listing that uh, also attached your exhibit F, it's from the lease agreement from last year. Um, most of these things, well, I should say several of these things have been completed, especially on pages kind of one and two. And as you get into the future page, the, the latter pages, a lot of those are taken directly, as I mentioned earlier from uh, Margaret's question. They're from the Venue Solutions Report, and they're things that they call out from a timing perspective that we'll probably need to address in you know, the year 2020 or 21 or 22. And really, we just want to get those on the list in, the, in previous years. And... You know, we'll continue to look at them, we'll continue to, to provide maintenance on those areas. And, you know, the replacement would be done if it needed to be done, but obviously we're not gonna go after a, a capital project unless it's something that, you know, really needs to be replaced at that time. We, we prefer to use our in-house staff, we prefer to use our preventative maintenance partners and continue to maintain the equipment as much as possible before going to a full replacement of any of this equipment. So with that, I think I'm done. I, again, we've got Sean, I think Michelle, we've got uh, Tim and Matt. So if there's any questions, we'd love to address those. And I'll also offer up, you know, we have time right now that if anybody would like to walk the building, you know, meet one-on-one, -on -one, talk through this a little bit more. We, we met with Jad, our facility um, liaison, walked through this several times. And um, so again, if anybody would like individual attention, individual questions, speak privately or just do a walk around the building. We would love to spend that time with you, but I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Margaret, any questions from you? Well, I, uh, I'm i glad to know Jed did that. I was looking at the building. I myself want to compliment your organization, Kyle, for how you presented this camp uh, proposal. Uh, it really was easy to read and the historical perspective that uh, you laid out and also the way, the positive way that you wrote about the um, way that you are looking at COVID and the, um, how it might affect uh, large gatherings in the future, uh, the planning you're doing. I thought this was an excellent report and readable, and I think it is what was, uh, what the lease uh, intended it to be, the kind of report that we would get. I, I think a lot of time went into this report. So for me, it's just all compliments on the pre presentation and the approach you all are using. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, I really appreciate that. Glenn, anything from you, sir? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, Kyle, what, you know, and, and, and I know that 
you know, and just kind of thinking long term about how some of these necessary, I mean, you kind of established that how this is, is funded through the ticket tax, et cetera. Obviously, there's no tickets being sold. Uh, you know, attendance is down. And we don't know at what point, you know, that ramps up to a sufficient level. Uh, have you guys given some thought, and I'm sure you have, about how maybe some of this work has been impacted by or this fund has been impacted by um, by that? And, and obviously time is the, you know, is the, you know, is this is what be affected the more time, the more, more, you know, the, the sales will be down. So what, can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, across the, you know, across the world, essentially, everybody's kind of in the same boat, especially for folks that are in similar funding positions as us, you know, like I kind of said earlier, the, this lease agreement was such a great product of 2019, right? Like it's a user generated uh, building, being funded that way, you know, no one saw COVID coming. So essentially kind of our stance right now, the best news is you know, we, I think we've done about $90 million over the past eight years worth of capital improvements in this building. We've really ramped up um, the past several years, which is fantastic. So the building's in great shape, as you can see by a lot of the comments made in 2017. So as we you know look now at our current funding position with those user funds, like you mentioned, you know, we're, I think we're okay overall taking a pause, like we, we suggested in this uh, report. And, you know, we're out very cautiously optimistic that we can get back to events and start generating those funds uh, early next year is, is the hope. And, you know, if, if anything, it, it is just a pause. That, that's the way we look at it. And honestly, you know, our, our organization's position is to come out of this stronger than we came into it. So that was the comment of re-examining and exploring different opportunities and not only in a post-COVID world, but just overall in our business strategy. So, you know, how are we re-engaging our season ticket citizens so they're ready to come back and A, they're going to feel safe in a post-COVID world, but B, they're just going to be so much more passionate about the organization and the team itself. And then obviously the concert industry, it's, you know, we saw everybody, I think you probably watched the ACMs last year or last night, sorry. And, you know, every artist on that stage essentially said how excited they were to come back and that they're going to come back and how, you know, I, I think their fans are ready for them to come back. So we're excited about that, and we're excited about generating those funds once that time is available. Uh, we've always pride ourselves on being one of the busiest buildings in North America. I would venture to say we are on uh, track to become one of the busiest yet again because coming out of COVID, I think there will be a lot of events once we get those protocols and procedures in place and have our fans excited to be back in that building. So, again, we're looking at it as a pause, and again, we're, I think the building's in good shape right now. We're taking this time internally with our staff to do things that we haven't had the chance to do because we're always so busy with events. So we're looking at different preventative maintenance programs that we can do internally. We're looking at you know small projects that whether they're cosmetic or it's a you know a leak that just constantly reoccurs. You know how can we track those down? Our staff is so excited to get back in the building and do those little things that they haven't been able to do over the past few years. So really just trying to take advantage of the situation. And like I said a while ago, really come out of this stronger than we, uh, than we entered. Glenn, anything else from you, sir? No, I just, <clears throat> just, you know, just, I just want to make sure that, you know, um, and I don't have some of the history, you know, that some of the others have kind of on, on this and the knowledge, you know, the working knowledge. I know, I know it is a great facility and I know, you know, that um, so, some of the maintenance that's been done, you know, pre-COVID, obviously, no, you're right, no one saw that coming. Um, and, and you know, still there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, how long and, and what that what that course back to uh, um, normal, or I, I'm always cautious about using that word, normal uh, is, but I uh, just want to make sure that we're cognizant of that and that I know you guys are looking at it, but um, to share with your, you know, your your thoughts and and if you have concerns, certainly uh, that as well as as we go along. That's all. Thanks, Glenn. All right. Thanks again, Kyle. Appreciate the uh, presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to our next item. It's. Uh, 
a breakdown of the Bridgestone Capital Asset Plan and the Metro, um, sorry, the Arena Revenue Fund and the Metro Finance Allocation. So, Monica, I'm going to turn this over to you. And we've got uh, also have Phil Carr from Chief Metro Accountant with us to answer some questions, and Bob Lackey has joined as well. Monica? Um, you know, over the last several months, a couple of times the board has asked about obligations and projected expenses related to the arena revenue fund. Um, you'll recall that this came up earlier this spring when the board was asked to approve expenses related to the closeout of Fort Ice Center Bellevue. Um, and more recently, as the board authorized additional funding for program management expenses related to the MLS stadium. But one expense that we've not discussed is an annual charge from Metro Finance Department for um, salaries of some of their employees who support um, our department. Obviously, we are a four-person department. We just became a four-person department this spring. And so we have, um, we have relied on the support and assistance of the Metro Finance Department. And so as um, the chair said, Chief Metro Accountant Phil Carr is on the call and he's gonna walk us through the uh, labor allocations that you see on the screen. Sure, uh, this is Phil Carr, the Chief Accountant. I appreciate the invitation to uh, join the board meeting. Uh, I've, I've never been to one of your board meetings and I've, uh, Told that the, I've been told that the food is really good, so I uh, I'm sorry that it's virtual, and hopefully one day I can maybe join one in person. Um, but the document that is on the screen right now is just a breakdown of the positions that are uh, having a portion of their salaries allocated to the sports authority. The uh, positions, uh, the first one is really uh, Bob Lackey's position, who uh, obviously had an allocation in FY20, will not have one in FY21. Uh, the other positions all really fall within finances, accounting, and accounts payable division. And again, the way it is uh, working, basically, each individual in those positions are assigned a percentage of their salaries and benefits to charge out to sports authority. So uh, the primary functions are being done by the uh, administrative services manager position under uh, in the accounting area. And then there's a couple of parties that are a little more supervisory and you know, kind of overseeing to get a smaller percentage. And then we, again, have someone in the accounts payable division who's processing invoices for uh, you know, the, the capital items, the operational and the debt service items, who is also getting an allocation. So for FY20, the total was about 137000 Again, that included uh, Bob Lackey's allocation. FY21, it's projected to be about 86,000. Uh, we aren't really at the point yet of looking at FY22, obviously, as we get into the budget for FY22, which I'm sure we'll be here before we know it. We will you know, evaluate these allocations and, and make that determination whether any adjustments are needed at that time. Uh, just as a point of reference, I uh, put the salaries there. Uh, again, what is actually being allocated is this portion of salary and the benefits on top of the salary. Uh, so anyway, that is just sort of a summary of, of the positions and the dollars. The other document that I was asked to prepare is a summary of the task uh, that finance is doing. If we want to go ahead and pull that document up, and then I can just take questions about both of them after uh, we look at that document.
Do we have that document to pull up on the screen for everyone? Alicia, do you have that document handy? We'll work to see if we can get that. I do. Okay. Uh, uh, we, we can distribute that out later if we need to. Uh, basically, it's a summary of, of everything that finance is going to support. Uh, there's certain things that are a little bit more as needed. Um, so we're being built and providing support uh, to answer any questions. Uh, I have a lot of um, monthly things that we're paying. Phil, I'm sorry. I'm, Phil, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, thank you. We needed to we needed to make sure everyone was muted. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, there's monthly transactions that we're doing. Obviously, there's various bank accounts that are maintained related to the sports authority debt. So we're making sure that the transactions that are hitting those bank accounts are appropriate and making sure that we have those balances correctly reflected on the ledger. There are you know, certain quarterly uh, things that we're doing, uh, one of which is just in relation to the the various loans, we're having to do uh, financial statements on a quarterly basis and distribute those to uh, the, the banks that, that have those loans. Uh, and then obviously there's a lot of annual stuff as well. We're currently closing the June 30, 20 fiscal year and uh, the sports authority is, is a part of Metro's financial statements. So uh, all the, the pieces that, that need to happen to pull together the annual uh, numbers for um, the sports authority are, are pulled into Metro's financial statements. Um, so again, just um, it's uh, certainly our, um, you know, we, we certainly appreciate the relationship that we have with sports authority and uh, again, continue to provide whatever you guys need. Uh, again, some of it's more routine and then we're always available as, as things are coming up that are uh, a little bit maybe outside the, the normal uh, things that we do. So anyway, just uh, I'll open it up if you guys have any questions for me or, or if you do need more information, I can certainly provide that to everyone. Thank you, Phil. Margaret, anything from you? Any questions? Yeah, I, I, uh... I'm sorry we don't have this task item because uh, that's where I, but I think you did a, a really good job of explaining that. Uh, so I'll be anxious to see that. What other um, agencies of Metro do you all allocate, take out from bond funds salaries for your finance department work? Uh, the one that's most comparable is Convention Center Authority. It, it's kind of a similar relationship. We are uh, providing a level of support for Convention Center Authority and allocating a portion uh, to Convention Center Authority. That's so the is that, are these employees uh, uh, receiving allocated funds for the Convention Center? Uh, it's not necessarily the same employees that are doing sports authority, but uh, it, it's comparable in, in that it would be you know, someone who's in the a similar role, uh, who's doing the accounting for sports authority, would be getting, or would be doing the accounting for convention center authority would be uh, an a portion of their salary would be uh, going as well. And, and I think the percentages are probably comparable. Uh, I, I think the, the level of support we do for the Venture Center Authority is, is pretty comparable to what we're doing for Sports Authority. How long has this been taking place that these funds have been allocated uh, to the Finance Department from the bond funds? How long yeah, I have been? to go back and look. I honestly don't know. It's, it's been a while. I mean, I mean, Bob might know that off the top of his head. He's, he's certainly been more involved uh, longer than I have, but I, I can certainly look back and, and answer that question. Bob, do you know the answer to that? Uh, give me a second. Uh, it's been several years, Margaret. Uh, and by the way, it's good to be with y'all. Yes, hello. It's good. We're hoping you'll be with us in another round too, so. 
I'm sure Michael will update us about that. But. Uh, I'm going to say it's at least been five or six years. And so what was done before that? I mean, finance just paid, paid right? And there was no, no money taken out of the arena fund, right? Uh, that would be correct. And then, so why was that changed? Either one of you, Mr. Carr. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine, you know, it was, the intention was to you know, look at uh, organizations that, that had a revenue source that we were supporting and to, you know, again, try to uh, take some of the costs that would normally be getting uh, you know, the tax supported funds for Metro. And it, it, you know, if we felt like we had a, a valid funding source and it was appropriate to use some of that funding source to support a portion of, of what we were doing uh, to support those organizations, you know, it was a, a budgetary decision to, to go ahead and, uh, and um, you know, make that change to uh, allocate a portion to those, uh, those entities Mark, and uh, also, revenue source. Uh, Margaret, I think it was more than just look where there were funding sources at the time. I think it was looking at the degree of support that finance was providing uh, also to the convention center. There were three particular agencies I was aware of. One was district energy, one was convention center, one was sports authority, and finance was providing a significant amount of resource to those three areas. Uh, I know because I was involved in all three of them, but finance was providing significant resource in various areas, whether it was processing through accounts payable, through accounting resource, and also project management resource. Uh, the intergovernmental agreement, uh, as you well know, uh, but not only for the convention center, but also for sports authority, uh, provided a means that required the finance department specifically for the sports authority to provide uh, accounting support for whatever was needed to assist the sports authority and it's similar for that of the uh, convention center in terms of the support that's needed and it's not just division of accounts it's finance period uh, in supporting these organizations so i think finance just took a look in terms of the amount of significant resource that was being provided uh, and said, you know, in terms of providing this resource or resources, uh, finance should be reasonably compensated for providing that service. And I think that was the decision process that kind of drove uh, starting to do that, given the amount of resource that was coming into the sports authority to help kind of service and offset that cost that finance was having to seek from the Metro Council each year to provide it. So can you, either one of you, tell me what input the sports authority had into how the percentages were determined that you would take from the fund to allocate for your services? Did it have any input or was it just kind of done? <laughs> uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, Bob, do you know if if there was, uh, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Margaret, that was not my decision. I, I can't say how the percentage, I think that's an excellent question in terms of the basis of the allocation. But that, yeah, uh, that's the uh, finance uh, director's decision, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, it, would, it would have been ultimately a joint decision, probably between finance director and, and I, I hesitate to say who made that ultimate call because I just don't know. Well, who has the authority, and Margaret, this might be a question to you, who has the authority to make those decisions under the fine indenture agreement or whatever agreement? There is an intergovernmental agreement and uh, which kind of restates the trust indenture from 1998 that does allow the uh, finance director to direct how the funds are spent according to a certain um, uh, according to different provisions in the trust indenture but one of which is you know other expenses lawful expenses of the uh, authority 
So is that under and re reimbursements for operating expenses for the uh, that Metro has already expended? So, uh, so you're saying this is under. Uh, there's several provisions, but this is under an other provision and reimbursement provision that's in there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would think that, I mean, if I had to choose one, that's probably what, what I would choose. <laughs> there's a there's a provision that allows the uh, allows funds in the arena revenue fund um, to be reimbursed. Okay, well, that's, I understand. I understand what you're saying. Okay, so just one question for you, Monica, and maybe uh, everybody else. How does our new uh, position, finance position, uh, interact with the uh, amount that they take out for services provided for us? Is there overlap? Are we able to, with that finance position, um, do some of those services? How does all of them work together? When we hired Melissa this spring and, and before that began the search for a finance manager, um, obviously we knew that that Bob was preparing for retirement um, with additional facilities and additional responsibilities. We felt that it would be really important to have someone who worked full time with the sports authority. So um, at this point, and, and you, you alluded to this earlier, you know, our hope is to bring Bob back as a, as a pensioner retiree so that he can properly train Melissa. But our expectation is over the next year as he's able to do that, that um, you know, many of these duties will transfer to her. We've had a couple of conversations with Phil Carr and, and um, Rhonda Pedley on his team and, and are trying to work through exactly what that looks like, understanding that there are bond obligations and things that Division of Accounts would want to continue to oversee and, and should. And so we are working through um, exactly what this transfer of roles looks like. And where are we with uh, Bob coming on board? I mean, they can tell us. Well, we hope to have it on the agenda for um, for next month. But um, again, understanding that his work previously was funded um, out of the arena revenue fund, we wanted to um, address this, especially in light of the questions that we've received over the last few months. So hopefully in October. So, so let me ask you, Monica, what concerns do you have, if any, about how money is allocated, it looks like for fiscal year uh, 2021, it's reduced due to Bob's departure. Uh, how does that interplay with what you just said and what you would be looking at next month as far as Bob time expenses? Um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of tasks, obviously, that the um, Division of Accounts performs, and we we really are grateful, and we, we need their support. Um, Margaret Darby provided me last week um, with a memo from legal uh, mentioning how, I think in 1997, the authority amended its bylaws um, so that the finance director would, would manage and have oversight over some of these funds. And so we, you know, there is a real partnership and collaboration that needs to um, continue. And Bob's role is would really, he would be returning to train Melissa. Um, and so I, you know, we can we can talk through what that would look like, and 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 most likely, um, the recommendation would be that um, that Bob's um, return is funded um, from the Arena Revenue Fund. Um, but then, as we move forward, we would anticipate that that allocation decreases um, as as Melissa continues to pick up and responsibilities are transferred, if that answers your question. 
Yes, I mean, I, I noticed the fiscal year 2021 is a reduced figure. And it does seem like looking at these tasks that are up here, that there's just a lot you know, that has been done by finance for us. And we know that we have not had anybody in our, in our staff who, you know, had the capability to do this, which is why we wanted to have them. So that's just, I, I think that that helps because obviously we appreciate all the support and need it. Um, but I just, this transition, I was trying to get a sense of what we anticipate. So I don't know if anybody can hear me because I'm because there's a lot of background, but um, that that's very helpful. And thank you for these tasks too. I see them now. No more questions. Thank you, Margaret. Glenn, anything from you, sir? No, Glenn, sorry, I was having trouble. You. trouble. I was having trouble in meetings. I don't, I do not have any further questions. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, Bob. And thank you, Phil. Monica, anything else you want to say? No, I, I do not. Um, I, I think that we will, you know, we'll continue this conversation annually. Phil mentioned that as we um, get into budget season and, and, and look at FY22, then I would anticipate that we will, um, we will see this again. Great. All right. Thank you. All right, next item we've got up is the Nissan Stadium Capital Project Update. We've got Janine Kaufman, the Titan CFO, and Bob Flynn, the Executive Vice President of Facilities, here to present for us. So Janine, I believe I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate it. This is Janine Kaufman, CFO and Senior Vice President with the Tennessee Titans. And we are gonna walk through some of the additions in regards to the CapEx communication tool. We added several projects to the anticipated list. Um, and if you will scroll down just a little bit, um, keep going. Perfect. This is kind of our list of projects that we have added to the anticipated list. So we wanted to make sure we got this in front of the finance committee early because what our plan is, is that we will start the implementation of these various projects as at the conclusion of the 2020 season. So we hope that's February and that we're playing deep into January. If Monday night was in any indication, um, we, we hope that's the case and hope to have some home playoff games. So with that, we did add about five new projects <clears throat> the point of sale system, the broadcast cabling plant replacement, that actually has been on the anticipated list for some time, but we do plan to kind of move forward with that as soon as the season's over. The intercom replacement in the control room, a wave central, which is also part of kind of the control room, and then the control room upgrade and replacement as well. Um, if you want to flip over to the Nissan Stadium CapEx communication tool, it's perfect, and go down to the anticipated list. Thank you, right here. And I don't know if you can blow that up a little bit so that they we can scroll in and kind of see the description of the projects. All of these projects were that we have added are in the facility assessment and the timing agrees, um, if not maybe a little bit delayed from the facility assessment, meaning the facility assessment could have recommended it in an early year, earlier year timeframe. And we have it on the calendar for, for 2021. Um, I, I think you all received this well in advance and I, I'm really at a point, most of these projects are very detailed in the description of the project. So I, I will be glad to just take questions, I think, from the group on any of these projects. Um, you know, point of sale is truly what it is. It's a point of sale system so that we can swipe credit cards and take credit cards throughout the building. The point of sale system has reached the end of its useful life. It's not PCI compliant. Um, all of our portables don't have um, the ability to take credit cards and you all can appreciate with COVID, 
people want to be able to insert their own credit card into a machine and get their credit card back without anyone touching their credit card. So that also makes it a little bit of um, a touchless system as well. And our current system is not that. The broadcast cabling plant, again, this is this was actually presented to the Sports Authority back, back in March of 2016. But it, it's limped along so far, but, but we're just really afraid that if we don't get it replaced um, after the 2020 season, it won't be functional. And what that system does is um, it transmits feeds to the actual control room and also to the networks so that we're actually able to broadcast the game out to TV. Um, the intercom replacement, um, and that is a system that allows the cameras throughout the building as they're going around and, you know, doing shots on the field or shots of the fans to be in a wireless situation. Those have also reached the end of their useful, um, end of their useful life. Sorry, that's the wave central that I'm talking about. It's reached the end of its useful life. Um, it's one is eight years old and one is six years old. The intercom replacement basically is a communication system between um, the members who are in the control room and the control room itself. We replaced um, some of this system several years ago, but this is actually the wired portion of the system. And then the last one is a full on control room upgrade. For those of you who were on the board back in 2012, you'll remember that we actually uh, replaced the control room in its entirety in 2012. And so this is another complete control room replacement. As you can imagine, working on a computer that is eight years old, that is an analogy for working in a control room that is eight years old. The equipment is out of date. Um, it, it doesn't work sometimes. We have to do patches and, and it just needs to be fully replaced. I put on the sheet what we think some of the cost estimates are, and then you'll see we're actually in the process of um, working on quotes. We've gone out um, for various RFPs, for example, on the point of sale system. And um, so we are, we are starting that process on some of these various projects. So I will be quiet and see if anyone has any questions. Bob Flynn is also on the line to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Janine. So Margaret, I'll go to you first. Any questions from you? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I just have so many documents and trying to make sure <laughs> is on the screen. So thank you. I'm glad I could unmute. So uh, Janine, your new projects are 15 million, right? Anticipated projects. That's correct, Margaret. We anticipate we anticipate about 15.6. We hope through you know the RFP process and, and such that we can bring that number down slightly, but but that's probably materially correct. And your letter of last week I think last week, nine, nine, 20 shows 21 point. I can't, it's hard for yeah, me to it's, see it's, it. Uh, 21, the current, yes, ma'am. The current receivable is 21.5 and then outstanding on the current projects is another 4.2. So we anticipate that at the end of the calendar year, we will, Margaret, be somewhere around receivable about 25.7 at the end of the calendar year this year. And when we start the other projects. And then, and so with the other 15 million, we're talking 40 million plus, right? At the end of calendar year 2021, that's correct. And uh, Glenn, uh, we have this CapEx tool they notify us of these projects. It doesn't necessarily mean we approve the projects or anything like that. It's just they are giving us a uh, heads up about what they're doing, that they're gonna go ahead and fund. But this tool is there so that we know what they think uh, Metro owes them for these, for these expenditures. Um, and I don't know if that's ever been explained what we're, why we're going through this process. So 
So in the minutes that we just approved, I asked this question last week, last time we met, and that is, uh, and I remember Kyle Clayton when he was just doing this presentation talking about uncomfortable conversations about capital expenditures. And I feel like we are in this position, uh, you know, in trying to figure out what we are doing with the capital expenditures and uh, what, if any, is Metro ob obligation. So what what is the status of that? And is there anybody on this call from Metro who could tell us what's the status of the uh, Titans discussion with the city about these capital needs now and going forward? Monica, is there anyone on, you know, that we can, that can speak to this, to Margaret's question? Um, Mark Sturdivan, are you on? I thought I saw you earlier. I am now, yes. <laughs> okay. Mark, I don't, uh, Mark, I don't know if um, you or um, our deputy mayor can address this in, in any way or offer up something that would be that would be helpful. Well, um, I'm going to have to apologize. I was on the phone just a second ago, so uh, I didn't. I, I was out of the conversation. Margaret, would you like to restate your question? Hi, Mark. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, we have a, with us presented today about forty million dollars worth of. Uh, capital expenditures on the stadium and another anticipated 25 million uh, being made or have been made and another 15 million anticipated. And we have this CapEx tool where we, the Titans tell us what they are, you know, doing on the stadium. Obviously uh, they uh, take the position that Metro is responsible for these capital improvements and so the, the number keeps ticking up, and I'm just wondering, can you tell us from Metro's point of view what we are doing? Obviously, the Sports Authority has no authority to uh, right. legislate funds. So what, where we are from Metro's point of view, taking uh, a look at these capital expenditures and uh, handling them and what we're doing going forward with capital expenditures. Well, um we're aware, obviously we're, we know about it and we're aware about, aware of it. And we've, and I've just started, you know, working in this role. So, and I've had one meeting with the Titans and uh, a couple meetings with uh, Metro folks. And so we're starting to develop uh, what we're going to try to do. Uh, I don't have an answer for you today, but we're working on it. And, you know, we'll have, things to report back to you in future meetings, but, um, and it's complex, obviously, and the numbers are, are big and the solutions are complex too. So uh, again, I don't, I don't have anything to share today, but I just know that we are engaged and uh, working with the Titans organization and talking about it internally. That's really good to know. And I'm also glad to know that you're involved because I know how much you know about uh, this area okay. and what you've done in building buildings throughout our city. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that you're involved and, and, uh, and look forward to hearing from you and the Titans. Uh, I know it's flex and, uh, but that's, that's a good sign. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret, anything else? No, no, thanks. No. Thank you. Glenn, any questions from you, sir? No questions for me. Thank you. Sorry, it just takes me a minute for whatever reason. I have to hit make the unmute button about three times. So, any questions from you, sir? No, no questions from me. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. That's okay. That's okay. No problem. Uh, Janine, uh, Bob Flynn, anything else from you all? No, sir. That concludes our report.
All right, thank you. Monica, anything else from you? Nothing from me, thank you. All right. All right, well, that was our last item on the agenda for today. Uh, does anyone have anything else they want to discuss before I adjourn? No. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, so this concludes the agenda for our meeting. And I want to remind everyone following us uh, to the full board meeting that will be on Metro Channel Network One. Thank you all, and we'll adjourn for today. And we'll be back here at 10.30 for the full board meeting. Thanks very much. Hey, Monica. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.